Well, I'm here, um, first of all, to bring you bad news. And then um, I also have some good news for you. The bad news is that we have waited far too long and done far too little to address the climate crisis. The good news is that we still can do it if we act at scale and immediately. And for that, we need all hands on deck. We need all of you. And I hope when you walk out of here today, you will be part of the team. So let me tell you how I got involved in this. It was uh, March 25th, 1889, when I picked up the New York Times and I uh, saw that the Exxon Valdez had spilled its uh, cargo of oil, crude oil, into Prince William Sound in Alaska. And I was shocked and outraged and thought, how can they let something like this happen? And the people who are responsible for this should be held accountable and thrown into jail. And a little later, I talked to a friend of mine who gave me an inconvenient truth, really. He said, Gordium, that oil, you ordered that oil. That oil was on the way to your gas tank. And um, that made me think. About a year later or so, uh, Saddam Hussein had in invaded uh, Kuwait and uh, the US launched Operation Desert Shield. And when I was watching these images on television of burning oil wells, I began to connect the dots. And it wasn't um, until maybe a week or two later that I was washing the dishes. And um, this was already out here in our old house here in East Hampton. And I turned the water on. And I hear that there's a well pump in the basement coming on as I'm turning the tap on. And when I turn off the water, it stops. And suddenly, I'm connecting more dots. And I realized that makes a power plant on Long Island run a little more to produce the electricity for that pump. And that makes an oil tanker come over or a gas pipeline run more gas. And suddenly, I felt this faucet is a very powerful remote control. I can turn an oil well on or off. And that was that. I suddenly felt empowered. I didn't feel powerless anymore. I had incredible power. I could go halfway the, around the world with my remote control, which was my faucet handle in the house. So I started installing low flow devices on all of our uh, taps and you know, in the shower, etc. I sw switched out light bulbs for energy efficient ones. Uh, I, I, I weather stripped around the, the doors and windows. And a couple of years later, my wife and I built a super energy efficient home with uh, passive solar uh, heating, thanks to a great green architect around here. Uh, I, we put solar hot water and solar panels on and virtually have no utility bills. Yeah, a little later, I figured maybe it's time to not just change light bulbs. Maybe it's time to change my, my career. And I did that in midlife and became a renewable energy advocate working to change the way we use and produce energy. And I feel very lucky, not only because I have found a job that I really love, but also because I feel we are alive at a critical moment in human history where we still have a chance to do something to address the climate change, uh, the climate crisis. If we don't do this, the next generation will not have that opportunity anymore. So it is really up to us to do that. Now, we got to do this, as I said, commensurate in scale and very quickly. So I'll talk about that for a little bit here. Uh, th th these are the uh, carbon uh, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere over the last 800,000 years on the left to today. We are now at 
410 parts per million as of June. We are way out of this natural variation that we've seen over the last hundreds of thousands of years. If we continue business as usual, continue to put greenhouse gases into the atmosphere at the rate we have, we'll be at 600 and probably beyond that. We cannot let that happen. So the way this works, you've seen slides about this earlier, is that we have a layer in the atmosphere that consists of greenhouse gases. And in a normal situation, the amount of heat that escapes back out into space equals roughly the amount of energy that's coming in from the sun in the form of light and then heat. And that's a natural and healthy state. As we put more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, uh, we are trapping more and more heat. And that's why our planet is heating up. We've never uh, put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than in the last 66 million years. And the amount of energy we trap is an enormous amount. And just to get you to understand the scale of it, I'll show you that uh, what we're doing is every day the equivalent of 400,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs, 365 days a year. <laughs> So this is the scale of the problem. 400,000 atomic bombs per day, every day of the year. That's the energy we're trapping by putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which comes primarily from burning fossil fuels, oil, coal, natural gas. Now, scientists have warned us uh, for a long time about this. We've waited far too long to take action. We now face a planetary emergency and have very little time left to safeguard our climate. We now know that we have a carbon budget of uh, gigatons of carbon that we can still emit. Uh, and we have to bring these emissions down drastically so that we are at zero emissions by mid-century, by about 2050. So we now know that we have maybe 20 or 30 years left to do that. We have to immediately, essentially, begin to decrease annual emissions until 20 or 30 years from now, we are at a level of zero. That's how we can avoid critical tipping points that would lead to catastrophic climate change, which really we cannot let happen. So this is really, in my mind, just like when you're coming into JFK Air Airport, you know, from Europe or somewhere else in the country, and the pilot announces we're going to have to begin our descent now, we cannot afford to go beyond that point where you have to begin your descent because we couldn't expect a safe landing if we wait another 10 or 15 years. And our economy to transform from a carbon-based economy to a carbon-free economy needs to adjust. We cannot do that overnight. We need several decades to do that. So we immediately have to begin to decrease these emissions. So, on this slide by Paul Hawkins, uh, the Drawdown Project, you see what our emission reductions could potentially be in various sectors. I will now focus on energy because that's where I, where I work, and that would be in uh, the yellow and the uh, blue and the uh, orange box all the way on the, on the side there. Uh, we here on the South Fork have taken steps and have set very aggressive goals on reducing emissions and switching to 100% renewable energy sources. The town of Southampton has adopted a 100% renewable electricity goal by the year 2025, and the town of East Hampton has done the same uh, except by 2020. The, the town of East Hampton went a step further and also said we also need to uh, generate the equivalent 
of 100% renewable energy for the transportation and the heating sector. And it's important to remember that the way we measure 100% uh, is uh, on an energy production versus consumption community-wide. So these goals are community-wide, not just for town facilities. It's community-wide. So in other words, when the annual consumption of energy in a community equals the production of renewable energy, that's when we have achieved our 100% goal. In East Hampton, we use a portfolio, or you could say a toolbox, of uh, things, technologies, and programs to uh, work towards our 100% goals. I'll just highlight a few here, given the short uh, time we have. Uh, we have. We offer free home energy audits, and that goes for Southampton as well, uh, to help homeowners to find out how they can make their homes more energy efficient. They use high-tech uh, building uh, science technologies that weren't available maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and those are, that's available for free for anyone um, who owns a home ar around here. We also uh, have the utility chipping in with free smart thermostats, Nest and uh, other smart thermostats, to help control peak demand in the summer and uh, throughout the year help us manage our energy consumption much better. Uh, East Hampton, I'm proud to say, is the first town on Long Island to have two large utility-scale battery storage facilities uh, going in right now, which can help us meet summer peak electric demand, but also can store excess solar and wind energy for later use. Both towns have a great program called the Solarize program, where uh, we make it much easier for homeowners and business owners to go solar and uh, to get a bulk purchase price. Uh, the towns have selected, both towns have selected uh, a solar installer uh, to, to do that, uh, to do these installations. In East Hampton, we're looking also to put solar panels on parking lots and in town buildings. And um, later this year, we'll have a large-scale solar farm uh, going into, opera into operation that will provide clean, renewable electricity to East Hampton. By 2022 or so, we will have a 15-turbine offshore wind farm in operation, which will be about 36 miles uh, off of Montauk Point. Uh, that offshore wind farm it will be the first offshore wind farm connected in New York State, and it'll be connected right here in our neighboring town in East Hampton. It will generate more electricity per year than the entire East Hampton community uses per year. So that will mean we have reached already with that our 100% renewable electricity goal in East Hampton. And then we are looking at a number of other innovative uh, technologies and um, mechanisms to meet our transportation and renewable heating goals, et cetera. It's a really exciting time, as I said earlier, to be alive because we now have all these amazing tools at our disposal. And again, with your help, we can bring this transition about. And we are not alone. I just came back from San Francisco where we had a meeting of um, all the cities that have set these clean energy goals. There are now over 80 cities and towns and regions that have committed to 100% clean energy and two states, the state of Hawaii and the state of California. Just last week, Governor Brown signed a bill that commits California, the entire state, to 100% renewable uh, energy. Uh, this is a worldwide movement, which is so encouraging because, of course, we need to do this not just in our own backyard, but all over the world, because climate change, of course, is a global problem. We've got the right stuff, we've got the right tools, we've got the know-how, we have everything we need to make this happen. We've got the money, the financial means, means, certainly in this country, to make this happen. What we need now is the political will, and that's, of course, where you come in. Uh, each and every one of you, each and every one of us, if you take just one small first step, it'll lead to the next and the next, and if we all do that, just like I did back in 1989, we can solve this problem. So let's just 
Do it. <laughs> Whatever it is you do, take the first step and then take the next one. And then, of course, very important, don't forget that it goes much beyond your own home, your own sphere. Work in your community. We've been talking about community here today. Engage in your community, help build our community, and um, support lo local organizations that are working on these issues. Uh, volunteer, connect, participate in the civic process, and um, just keep going. And we will solve this problem. And most importantly, don't forget to vote. Now, important. Some folks may think that 100% um, renewable is sort of a newfangled idea and far out there, but um, it obviously isn't. We've done this for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, ultimately, renewable energy is the only energy source which can meet the energy needs of 9 billion people we'll have on this planet soon in a sustainable way. Renewable energy is really a revolutionary idea and 100% is what we need now. Uh, and that, that idea is an idea whose time has come. Uh, maybe it's no coincidence that the um, town seals of both of our towns have um, symbols of renewable energy in there. You can find the sun and the wind in here, right? Um, and Mother Nature has given us a deadline. Ignoring Mother Nature's deadline is not an option and never a good idea. And when our children and grandchildren will ask us, what did you do about the climate crisis? We must be able to tell them, we did everything we could, and we did it just in time. Thank you. <laughs>